Good morning. I'd like to call the Committee on Administration and Management of the Administrative Conference to order. Um, for those of you on the phone, this is John Cooney, the Committee Chair. Welcome. I want to welcome everybody here in the room to uh, our second meeting on uh, proposed recommendation on incorporation by reference in federal regulations. Um, the way we will proceed is um, um, as set forth in the agenda. We'll start with the approval of minutes, and then as is traditional, I'll go around the room and ask everyone to introduce themselves and then ask the people on the phone to introduce themselves as well. At that point, I'd like to t um, turn the, um, the meeting over to our chairman, uh, Paul Verkheil, for a few opening comments, and then we'll come back and... Um, Brett, uh, George Lynn. And has joined the conference. And begin the incorporation by reference. Um, this is the second session. Um, we have a revised version of... Um, uh, uh, Emily Bremer's report, which keeps getting stronger from uh, version to version. Um, and I think today we should try to focus our discussion on the um, recommendation that's before the committee for action. Um, I will, um, when we reach that, I will try to um, reserve a substantial portion of time in case there are any issues to be discussed on the second and third recommendations um, about uh, updating the incorporations by reference and processing problems. The discussion in the first session tended to focus almost exclusively on the copyright issue, and it undoubtedly will take up a good chunk of our time today. But I want to leave time necessary. Um, I will cut off debate on that issue and go to the other issues to make certain that everything is fully aired before the committee members are asked to vote. Um, and, um, and then um, we will proceed in the normal course for these committees. We'll ask the um, the uh, members of the committee who are present in the room speak first, then members of the committee, if any, on the phone. And then um, if there are, um, I see we have quite a few people from the standard setting organizations here today. So I think I'll ask if there is anyone on the phone, um, Carl Malamud or others, who uh, wish to be heard um, from the perspective of the uh, greater transparency point of view. And then since they're here present, I'll ask the standard setting bodies to speak. So with that as um, uh, the order of business today, I'd first ask if um, we could have a motion for approval of the minutes of our last meeting. I may so move. Second. Um, any objections to the uh, motion? Hearing none, then we'll deem the, uh, the motion to have been adopted. And at this point, um, we'll go around the room and ask people to introduce themselves. Jonathan? I'm John Siegel. I'm the Director of Research and Policy for the Administrative Conference. Uh, Paul Verkeil, Chairman of the Conference. I'm Scott Rafferty. I'm Staff Counsel for this committee. I'm Jim Tozzi, a public member. David Frederick, public member. Scott Cooper, American National Standards Institute. Lisa Scarbonne, Solid Coast Guard, not a committee member. Amy Bunk, Office of the Federal Register, committee member. Emily Bremer, Attorney Advisor to the Conference and in-house researcher for this project. Bruce Mahone, SAE International. Tim Mellon, SAE International. Natasha Butler, Acto Worldwide. Kevin Segre, Wiles Office of Science and Technology Policy. Martin Sussman, Social Security Administration. Robert Rain, American Society of Technology. If there are any members on the phone, I'd ask them to introduce themselves <coughs> now. Uh, Bill Carl Malamud again. from Public Resource. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Carl. <laughs> uh, it's Carl Malamud from Public Resource. And if I could remind people in the room to speak up, we can barely hear you. Thanks. Uh, Bill Lunenberg, I'm uh, the ABA Ad Law Section uh, Liaison to uh, ACUS. If that, if that, Bardos, government member. Good. If that's all the members who want to introduce themselves, if anyone else is on the phone, if, could you please introduce yourself now? The system said a Brett joined the conference. Uh, Brett Jordan is DOT. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. I was just introduced, so. Uh, Brett Shortland, DOT, also Max General Geyer. Has joined the conference. Max? Yes. Welcome, Max. So, Max Dyer, Partnership for Public Service. Committee, Hi. committee member. Mm -hmm. Very good. If there's no one further to be introduced um, on the phone, I will turn this over <laughs> to the chairman for opening remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to make a few. Uh, observations given, given the fact really based on the managers amendments that, that you have before you uh, given the fact that in the last since we last met uh, we've received some information and we and we've made some thinking uh, 
refine our thinking a little bit, and uh, and that's what these these uh, <coughs> amendments reflect. So, the, the sort of two key documents that came through, and which you have, of course, uh, one is the uh, the uh, submission from the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation, joined by several other open government organizations. Uh, which emphasize that, uh, obviously, uh, the... Warren Belmar has joined the conference. Uh, which emphasize... Morning, Warren. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the um, transparency dimensions of this issue. And, and so we, we took those comments uh, seriously. And then, perhaps most important, the uh, uh, since the last meeting, the... Uh, National Science and Technology Council issued its federal engagement in standards activities to address national priorities, which is a reflection uh, of the uh, administrator's, administration's point of view, and which we have, as you have seen, incorporated into to our work, and we think really gives us uh, the opportunity to make uh, some directions very clear. So when you look at, primarily this, this comes up in the context of copyright, of course, and all we've done in the draft recommendation, but it, I think it is, it, is, it is certainly important, is to uh, reinforce the direction that the administration has recommended we take. We preserved certainly the question of copyright as an issue beyond our uh, canon control. Uh, we believe we're leaving that open, and we, I think, continued obviously to respect the importance of SSOs in the collaborative process of of government, which is what we have in front of us. Uh, but we've also made a little active voice choices trying to get uh, agencies to, uh, in, I think, really to take the uh, administration's overall principles of transparency into account when they make decisions. And that was account for most of the, the changes. But I, I thought it was important to let the committee know what was going on in our head before, between the last meeting and this in order to get where we are now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You. I'll now turn to um, Jonathan Siegel for a more detailed explanation of the changes that have been made in the uh, the report itself and in the uh, proposed recommendation between our first meeting and today. Yes. Uh, so to comment on that topic, uh, there were some changes to the report. Uh, the main change was an addition of an analysis of the issue of fair use. So that now appears in the report. Uh, bear in mind, of course, the committee does not adopt the report. The committee only adopts uh, a recommendation. Uh, on the recommendation, the preamble is new. I don't think we had uh, anything in the preamble last time, so that's all new. Um, what's, what's mostly happened uh, in the recommendation uh, is, as uh, Paul was saying, um, we recognize now uh, more explicitly in the preamble uh, on the copyright issue that there's some uncertainty uh, in the copyright law as it stands. And so the recommendation, I think, reflects an attempt, uh, given the uncertainty in the copyright law, to uh, modestly push agencies in the direction of working uh, with holders of copyright when they incorporate by reference to ensure the reasonable availability uh, of the incorporated materials. And uh, the heart of that is in uh, recommendation number three, which has been adjusted. Uh, recommendation number three previously had subparts Lenny A. Lenny Lowentritt, GSA. Has joined the conference. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Recommendation number three previously had subparts A and B uh, that the committee didn't care for last time. Uh, those were cut. We have uh, some new subparts uh, that reflect, as I say, this desire to encourage agencies uh, to work with copyright holders to ensure availability of incorporated materials while still respecting uh, the copyright holder's interest in their intellectual property. Uh, so that's the biggest substantive change. If you look at the red line, um, which was available on our website, and I, I don't know if we printed out copies for everybody, but there's a whole lot of red in uh, the remaining parts of the recommendation. That was primarily changes that uh, I don't think are very substantive. They're mostly intended to clarify uh, what the recommendation was already intended to say. Uh, the only one I would particularly call your attention to is a change to uh, recommendation 11C, uh, which just clarifies that the, the biggest importance of recommendation 11 would be for those agencies uh, that are bound by 
hybrid rulemaking requirements, which is to say rulemaking requirements that are more stringent than the basic Section 553 requirements, although not as stringent as 556 and 557. Um, so for those agencies, it is a particular challenge to keep up with uh, updates to incorporated materials. So that's, that would be the kind of agency that would most benefit from <coughs> 11. Uh, other than that, I think it's fair to say that most of what happened to the rest of the recommendation is just clarification. Thank you very much. As a final preliminary matter, I'd like to turn to Emily Brenner first as an excuse to congratulate you again on a solid piece of work that keeps getting stronger and to see if there are any um, additional points that you'd like to bring before the group that you found out in, as you continued to re your research between the two meetings. Um, I think most of the development has happened in the recommendation and I think it would be best to leave as much time as possible to the committee's discussion. So I appreciate your thanks and I'll, uh, I'll just let the committee get into it. Very good. Then we'll start the discussion. Uh, I'd like to focus um, the discussion on the proposal that's before us, the recommendation for adoption. And um, rather than have a round of preliminary comments, I think I'll jump directly to the first issue because I think uh, most of the comments will come out in the course of the discussion of ensuring that incorporated materials are reasonably available. And for the committee members on the phone, I'll propose to start by going around the table here in the room. And as soon as we've finished one tour, I'll come to the members on the phone and then open it up to uh, others who are attending the meeting here today. Would anyone at the committee in the room uh, care to be heard on the first issue, um, the recommendation on ensuring incorporated materials are reasonably available to members of the public? This may be a first for you, because I, I, see, I see no hands up at the table. Um, so um, reserving their right to come back in um, as the discussion um, develops, I'll ask if there are any members of the committee on the phone who wish to be heard on the incorporation point. Uh, John, uh, I, I have to say that first point uh, about ensuring reasonable availability, given the problems with copyright, it, it just comes across as asking agencies to do what may be impossible in their view. And I, and I understand that the conference can't um, change copyright law, but it does seem to me that at a minimum, part of the recommendation should encourage Congress to look at this a area and determine whether, in fact, agencies can fully involve the public and uh, make law reasonably accessible in light of copyright restrictions and, if necessary, change that law to make sure that agencies can do what they are supposed to do. And it, it does disturb me that, that ACUS, that should be uh, and generally is, fully uh, focused on the need for uh, involving the public and public notice, um, would issue this... Uh, the, a, this kind of directive, which really, I think anybody who is familiar with this conversation will come away scratching their head. Well, how can they do it when they, the agencies may have to go hat in hand to the copyright holder to negotiate uh, some availability? So I think there has to be some kind of at least request to Congress to look at this problem. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the phone from the committee who wishes uh, to Yeah, this is uh, Carl Malamud. I guess I would uh, come to the same conclusion from the opposite uh, direction, uh, which is I, I would like to see a much stronger um, statement of, about public access and um, government access, frankly, to these, uh, to these standards. And it seems like this is definitely a situation where Congress or the court or somebody, as, as I said in one of my comments, above our pay grade, um, needs to help resolve this, this ambiguity in the law uh, that is placing the regulators in a very difficult position of mandating um, regulations that incorporate standards that cost anywhere from, you know, $60 to hundreds of dollars per copy. Uh, this is Warren Belmar, also on the line. I'm not quite sure I understand what the ambiguity in the law is. Copyright holders are entitled to sell access to their copyrighted materials. Are we saying that you know, we should pass a statute that takes away that property right? Well, I think you should probably read the letter that EFF and the um, 
the uh, Association of Research Libraries submitted. I, I do think there is some a ambiguity in the law. Um, our position and is, I, I, and our position should be, not the librarians, are we urging that Congress should pass a law to take away the property rights of copyright holders because the government would find it convenient to adopt a standard they developed as a matter of law? I would say that the right of public access to the rules that govern their, their daily lives is a very important principle in American law, and I think we need to recognize that that principle is, is on the table. And, and, and Warren, I don't think I suggested that Congress definitely enact something taking away property rights, but rather that they it look at this issue and the uh, different uh, considerations and decide how to balance those out. I don't think the, 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 the conference necessarily should, um, and I, I doubt it would take a position pro or con, but it certainly could invite Congress to look at this, at this area. Could I ask our last speaker to identify himself, please? There's some uh, scratching of heads in the room trying to figure out your identity. Yeah, that's, uh, this is Bill Lunenberg. Thank you. Um, Jim Tozzi in the room has his hand up. Jim, would you like to comment? Uh, 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 first, a question. Do we, the ZACAS generally make, in addition to agency recommendations, is we generally make recommendations on legislation? Uh, it is certainly within our purview to make a recommendation to Congress, yes. Okay. Second, uh, I guess I am agree with some of this. I think Mr. Belmar, uh, isn't the copy, I, I don't think that the VIC, is it the VEC decision that you're talking about? I mean, that's just a small little opening. I don't think there, uh, that that rises to the stature of a big hole in the copyright law. I mean, the copyright law still stands. So I guess, is the is it a recommendation that we are going to ask the Congress to look into it, or are we asking more than that? I'm not sure what the recommendation is on the table. Is, I mean, w would we say, is it a recommendation that ACA says, I don't think there's that ambiguity that that's strong. Uh, uh, do we ask the Congress just to look at this? What is the nature of the recommendation we make to the Congress? I'm not clear on that. Uh, Bill, would you like to uh, address that first? Well, I, I think what I suggested was that we simply ask Congress to uh, examine the conflict between copyright claims and the ability of agencies to involve, uh, involve the public and uh, make the law reasonably accessible and, de uh, and decide how to balance those considerations to maximize the ability of agencies to do what, uh, what they're supposed to do in terms of public involvement and the accessibility of information uh, in terms of what legal obligations are, but that's as far that's that's as far as I uh, I think ACAS could likely go in these circumstances. I don't know if that answers Jim's question. Yes, it does because that's a lot clearer. Um, are there other members of the committee who wish to be heard at this point? Hearing none and seeing no hands in the room, um, now I'll um, turn it over to um, other people who are participating in the call and in the meeting who wish to be heard on the issue. I think first I would like to ask if there are anyone from the library community or any of the people who submitted comments asking for greater openness and transparency who wish to be heard. I think that I can see the people from the standard setting organizations. I'll come to them next, but I think it may be better to structure the call as if we ask the people um, who might be in support of the, the Lundenberg approach if they wish to be heard now. Um, uh, hearing nobody, um, I think I'll turn to the standard setting organizations now, and I'll recognize Mr. Cooper first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'll try to talk a little louder. I, I think it's wrong to pose this as an either-or situation. Um, I think that what you've got here in words like reasonably available uh, is a dynamic, because what's reasonably available today is much different than what would be considered reasonably available even five years ago, and certainly ten years ago. And the whole dissemination of, of information is so different than it has been in the past. So I think that the term carries through to, to reflect that terminology and that te the, the, the growth of technologies. I think to change those words or to try to resolve what I think is this dynamic 
just doesn't make sense because I think these things happen on their own. We just by the fact that we have so many standards developers participating in this process, I think shows that this is a, a, a reasonably uh, available kind of uh, kind of situation where we can get standards into the uh, the public domain in ways where there is that that understanding with agencies and, and certainly. Uh, the NST uh, C uh, document describes, I think, exactly how that that dynamic works between federal agencies and the standards community. So I, I think you've got something that already works, and it's not one where it's a snapshot in time. We're seeing changes, um, not on a daily basis, perhaps, but certainly weekly or monthly, where things are put in, into the public domain, where we have opportunities to put things in a read-only fashion on the websites of, of standards developers. And so I think the process is working, and I think to try to interfere with that existing process, I think would would not be um, um, something that would be uh, either effective or really necessary. Thank you. Um, would any of the other people in the room uh, wish to be heard? Uh, yes, this is Bruce Mahone from SAE International. Uh, I agree with Mr. Cooper. I believe we have a system that is working that. Uh, Agencies are working out reasonable arrangements with uh, standards organizations, and uh, which is why, as I said at the last meeting, I uh, endorse the approach Ms. Bremer put in her, uh, her uh, report that uh, all agencies consider all the different aspects of the copyrights and the availability and work out a reasonable arrangement with the uh, copyright holders. I think that's working very well, and I would encourage us to stay with that approach. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to be heard? Yeah. Never went wrong. I think uh, one dur during the period between last meeting and this meeting, one thing we did do was reach out to OMB and specifically to the staff who are in charge with um, with circular A119. And I think we need to be careful about characterizing this as solely a conflict between copyright and public access. Um, as I explained in the report and as, as I think OMB impressed upon us, there's more to it than that. There's, um, and it, you know, there's a, a real regime here of allowing agencies to use privately developed standards in ways that provide significant benefits both to the public interest, to agencies, and to regulated parties. So you know, I, I am sympathetic to the, the concerns about public access, but I think we do need to be a little bit, and one of the reasons I was a little bit careful in my report is because there's a potential, a real potential to create a lot of problems in other areas that don't involve just Back copyright. has left the conference. I've offended him, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I just, I just want to, I just want to emphasize that this is a very complex issue. Jonathan Siegel? Uh, as always, I would remind everyone that, that we're just the staff and it's up to the committee to make these decisions. So my remarks are just, you know, staff thoughts. Uh, but as I've been thinking about this uh, suggestion that the recommendation, uh, make a recommendation that Congress look at this issue, I, I would just offer two observations. First, somewhat along the lines of what Emily just said, uh, it's not just a problem that there's an ambiguity in copyright law that might be clarified. There's, there's also just the inherent difficulty of uh, wanting something to be free and yet wanting it to be developed by the private sector. Uh, you know, you could, you could make a similar observation about pharmaceutical products. It would be nice if they were free, but then who would develop them? So uh, that would just need to be taken into account uh, in, in solving the problem. And then, as I, as I said in response to Jim Tozzi's question, it is certainly within ACUS's purview to make recommendations to Congress, and uh, we, we have done that in the past, and we have some such recommendations pending. But I, I would just have some reluctance uh, to make a recommendation that in, in essence says to Congress, we've identified the problem, now you solve it. Uh, it's, it's not as though ACUS never makes such recommendations. We, we, we do that, but I would, I would be somewhat hesitant to say that specifically to Congress. I think the way ACUS can most be helpful to Congress is to say, you know, here's a suggested solution to a problem rather than simply saying, we can't figure this out, so Congress, you do it. Yeah, I agree entirely. Uh, I say I don't think there's a there's a uh, there's an issue with the law. It's a trivial one. I think that, that I think you have a public policy issue of whether and how you make this balance between free access 
and maximum, and I think it's a policy issue. And until we resolve it, it seems a, real, a little unusual for us to recommend. I agree with you completely. Well, this is a big issue. We have no views on it. You solve it. Uh, I, it doesn't seem to be ACUS-like recommendations to me. I agree with you. Does anyone else wish to be heard? Well, then I'll um, state my views on this. That I, I, I don't accept the, uh, the use of the term conflict. I don't think that's right. I think what the report has done here is draw, uh, identify that there are two important uh, values that are on the table. Um, the value of the private-public uh, sector partnership in developing um, these kinds of uh, standards and getting the benefit of the, the involvement in trying to work out what would be the most efficient way of going about it. And the uh, interest in providing maximum information possible to members of the public so that they can make informed decisions whether to comment on rules and then they can track the results of a rule after the fact. I would take these not as in conflict, but as potentially inconsistent from case to case. Um, it's hard to predict in advance whether there's going to be a problem because as Emily's report has identified, um, there has been substantial um, accommodation over a period of time. The standard setting bodies have been willing to work with the agencies on a case by case basis to try to find ways to resolve the concerns and to try to provide appropriate information to the public. What the report is is um, uh, to remind the agencies that they have substantial discretion and uh, that they should drive forward to try to find an accommodation to the potential inconsistency if possible and also to um, um, to remind the standard setting groups that uh, the public has an important right to know here and that they should be aware of that wow. when they engage in the discussions with the agency. And so what we are doing here is basically telling the agencies, bearing in mind the discretion you have and ultimately the ability to pull the plug and draft your own um, um, rule if you think that's appropriate, um, you should be um, um, proactive in reaching out and trying to drive the discussion with the standard setting group to see how far it's, far it's possible to go in the, um, in the particular case to try to provide um, a great deal of information to the public. Now, with respect to the congressional aspect of this, this appears to be an area that Congress has been happy with, the way it's been administered by OMB over the years in trying to accommodate um, the potential inconsistency. What's different in what us, has us here today is the, uh, the introduction of the Internet, uh, the public's demand for information, the public's expectation that a large amount of information will be available to it through the Internet. And so that's the new factor that we uh, have to take into account um, because, as I said at the last meeting, there's a, both a, 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 a legal literature and pragmatic evidence to show that information just wants to be free. It has a desire to try to leak out. So um, I think that we've identified what is a potential issue here, which is that perhaps something about the nature of the Internet will cause the, the stasis, the accommodation, the balance that Congress seems to be happy with to change over time. And, but I don't think that we have the conflict yet. I don't think that we can show that there is an irremediable problem here that needs congressional resolution. I think what we have is a, re is a recommendation of the agencies to try to drive the process forward and to explore how we can make information available to people in an Internet era. And I think that at some point in the future, we'll be able to judge the results of the agency effort and the pattern of accommodations they've been able to reach with the standard setting organizations. I agree that there could be a problem in the future, but I don't think that we're there yet. So my conclusion is that this issue is not ripe to recommend to Congress because all we've, rec well, we've identified is a potential inconsistency that could turn into a deadlock somewhere down the line. And after that filibuster, I'll be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> And I, you stated it perfectly, and it still stays within the realm of the agency to, as you phrased it, pull the plug if agreement can't be reached, which puts pressure on both sides to reach agreement. But I think the one policy that cannot be forgotten is the policy that the public has to have access to the full text of the laws which it's obligated to obey. Is there anyone else who wishes to be heard on this issue, or are we ready to move to a uh, vote on the, uh, I'll propose it in block in the first place, on the first um, issue on ensuring incorporated materials are reasonably available? Can I point out, we haven't voted on the manager's amendment. Ah, 
the uh, which would replace the, the, the Wait, text that was well, previously circulated. Make, you are correct. Make some changes. Yes. Yeah. These, are, these are the red lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the, you, you should all have the. You, you should all have something in red line proposed manager's amendment that just has a few changes to both the preamble and uh, the first three recommendations. So uh, as a preliminary matter then, which we'll have to accommodate at some point without prejudice to the other issues, um, I would uh, appreciate a motion to uh, consider the management uh, manager's amendment as the text on which we will be voting when votes start. Is there a motion? Okay. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Good. Um, then the question before the committee members is, shall we uh, use the manager's amendment as the text um, that we will vote on as to what the proposed recommendation would? Um, all, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Are, there any are there any objections? Say no, please. Good. Then the text that we'll be proceeding from is the manager's amendment. And then uh, I may um, restate the, um, um, my prior question. Are we ready to move to a vote on the adoption of recommendations one through five on ensuring incorporated materials are reasonably available? I just have one question on some of the language in um, the intro to three that was changed by the manager's amendment. It had formally said when an agency is considering incorporating copyrighted material, and it I'll pass that. This is the one that was from the internet. And the suggestion is that that might be a, a, a more artful term than the, the passive voice that is used here, material that cannot be published without infringing yes. copyright? <laughs> if I could just point out, uh, you're, change of course, Amy, perfectly free to move to change that language. That's not a change in the manager's amendment. That's, that's a change. That was a change made between meetings. It's not specifically oh, okay. in the manager's amendment. Oh, all right. But, but you're perfectly free to suggest that that language be altered. Okay, I'd still like to suggest that it be. <laughs> so just so we know where we are, where, where are we? What, um, what, what language? This is on recommendation three, uh, not any of the subparts, the main part, where now the we say, yes, yes, exactly. yes, now we say when an agency is considering incorporating by reference into a regulation material that cannot be published without infringing copyright, whereas before we said when an agency is considering incorporating by reference copyrighted material. Uh, I think just to explain why that change got made, I believe this phrase was chosen uh, because it incorporates not only the concept that material might or may not be copyrighted, but that some portion of copyrighted material might still be published anyway uh, because it would constitute a fair use uh, or for some other reason that it, it even though it's copyrighted, uh, the, the fact uh, fact idea distinction, fact excuse me, fact expression distinction, there might be various reasons why some portion of copyrighted material could be published without infringing copyright. So it I think that's why that language was chosen instead of just copyrighted material. But again, if, if the committee members would Still prefer that that whole thing be changed to copyright. Well, I, I, material, it's, that's fine. I'm just putting it up before the committee because I just it's still copyrighted material, whatever it is. Yep. Whether or not the copyright holder chooses to release it or not. Okay. That's right. Do any of the members of the committee um, wish to be heard on the issue? Um, hearing no comments, then um, I'll, I'll turn to the ACA staff for advice as to how we should <laughs> well, just ask if people pref would prefer that that change be made. I mean, so the, the, the suggested change is change material that cannot be published without infringing copyright in the chef code of number three to copyrighted material. So I think we're um, hearing no discussion. We're ready to put that to a vote. Mm -hmm. So uh, would everyone who would prefer the change that's well, did been you proposed? Make a motion? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'll <laughs> make a motion to have that change. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd need a second. I can't disagree with Amy. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll interpret that as a second. <laughs> and, and then we'll, um, I'll propose that we move to a vote. Um, all in favor of adopting the, um, the proposed amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 For those opposed, say nay. Nay. I, th I think there was one nay and three ayes in the room, so uh, I believe that the ayes have it. 
Uh, would anyone else like to uh, propose an amendment to the text of the first five recommendations before a uh, motion is made to consider them in block? Um, yeah, David Frederick? Well, I just have a question that if we're going to do that, are we going to conform number three to the language of number two? Because number three has the same passive without infringing issue, which would seem to put the agency officials to the task of figuring out whether there would be a violation of copyright, which seems like an additional legal task that the amendment would relieve them of. Um. I think your point is well taken, and I'll treat that as a motion. Is, is there a second? Well, it was more of a question. Well, it was a motion, but, <laughs> no, but, but I, I, I think it's worthy of being elevated immediately to the motion stage. Because it's more work for the agencies, as yes. David said. He has to make another test. I'll second it. And so, David made the first one. I'll, he, yeah. he, he made the motion. She seconded it. Okay. So, um, uh, again, I'll ask the members of the committee for a vote. All in favor well, of the... Uh, I might just uh, this report. is Carl. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what the motion was. Uh, I, we just couldn't hear it here on the phone. I take it the suggestion now is to change number two. We, we just changed number three. Oh, I thought we changed number two. I, no, no. We just changed I think number two and number three would seem to be... All right. Yeah. They should be the same okay. formulation, okay. I would think. Uh, yeah. Um... If you don't, if you if you don't make the changes in both of them, they look at it. One requires a higher level of test. Each thing is right. Are you able to hear the discussion on the phone? The air conditioner in the room has now turned off. <laughs> I, I can hear it when people speak up. Yes. Uh, I guess at this point, with the, the, to implement that change, we would change two to if an agency incorporates by reference material that is not copyrighted. That would that would replace everything from there to the comma. Right. Yes, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, Amy, is that um, your interpretation as well? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but wouldn't that drop the legal the other legal concern? No, we could maintain that. The only the only change would be. It would, it would say, if an agency incorporates by reference material that is not copyrighted or subject to other legal protection. Oh, right. Okay. Correct. So, with the uh, proposed amendment as edited by the Committee on Style, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, are we ready to proceed to a vote on this? Hearing no, yes. fur no further comments, then I'd ask uh, for the yeas and nays. All in favor of the conforming amendment to uh, Recommendation 2, please so signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, please say no. I, I believe the vote is unanimous then, so this is uh, Proposal 2 is now, uh, is now amended. So I think we're now ready to proceed to the, uh, the vote on the uh, adoption of the first five recommendations, unless I hear that somebody has an additional issue they wish to raise. Uh, hearing no objection, then um, uh, I, um, I would move that we um, move to the adoption of the first five articles on block and ask for a second. Second. Um, then um, I'll ask for the yeas and nays. Those in favor of adopting the first five recommendations, please so signify by stating aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No, no. I, the, uh, there were two negative votes. I heard at least four affirmative votes in the room. And one on the phone. And one on the phone. So I think that the um, it's uh, by a vote of five to two, the motion is carried. Then we will turn now to uh, the discussion of the second issue. Um, and this will updating incorporations by reference, which is a precursor to a, a vote to adopt in block. Um, recommendations 6 through 11. And I'd ask if um, any of the members of the committee in the room wish to be heard on recommendations 6 through 11. Uh, Jim Cozy. Now, uh, could you, I don't understand 11. I thought we, thought we, I thought the executive branch had that authority now. On, 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 on number 11, yeah. it says Congress should consider authorizing agencies to do the following. Mm -hmm. And 
Gee, I thought we had all the, uh, the agencies had that authority now. I don't, what am I missing that they can't do that? Well, right now? as I said before, the the most important aspect of it is 11C. There are some agencies, OSHA is an example, and, and OSHA does use incorporation by reference, so this would be relevant to them, that cannot promulgate regulations using the simple and familiar 553 procedures. They have additional procedural requirements, right. which means that when all they want to do is update an incorporation by reference, because remember, dynamic incorporation by reference is not permitted. When an agency uses incorporation by reference, it has to incorporate a particular version of a standard. Uh, or whatever other matter is incorporated. So if the standard setting organization says, well, now we have the 2011 version of the standard, and all the agency wants to do is say, okay, previously we told everyone comply with the 2006 version of the standard. Now we want everyone to comply with the So what do they do now, John, the under, under current statutes? Well, they either they use all the additional process they're required to use, which is costly, wow, or yeah. they don't update, and then you've got the agency saying oh, comply with the 2006 version. Meantime, the marketplace has moved down to the 2011 version. So you know, the 2006 version, if we're talking about, say, a hard hat, you know, the 2006 version may not even be sold in the marketplace anymore. So people are all technically out of compliance with the agency's regulation, even though the 2011 version may be safer, mm -hmm. uh, which is a problem. And as Emily's report uh, discusses, agencies have their solutions. Some of them say, well, we'll, we'll issue an equivalency determination, or we'll say, well, this is, it's a violation, but it's a de minimis violation, so we'll use our enforcement discretion. So it's, uh, there are various strategies that agencies are using, but particularly for agencies that are bound by hybrid rulemaking requirements, it, the strategy of saying, well, let's update the regulation is costly. So, so that, that, that's what advantage would be gained. But even for the agencies that, like OSHA that aren't hybrid agencies, they now have to go out for notice and comment on, uh, on every, every, every time they... I, I thought they squeaked by some, some other ways. Is that what they do, Amy? Uh, can you... I'm sorry. I thought they're saying on every time if SAE comes out with a standard, uh, 101 and now there's a 110 and they want to take 110. Do they issue an NPR, or go through the rulemaking process, every agency to, uh, to, 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 to adopt the new standard? What we tell agencies is that if they think they need to go through notice and comment, then that's what they need to do. If they think, because it's just technical changes within the standard and they can right. maybe use a faster method, they could. But like they were saying, OSHA, Yes, yeah, so this is really OSHA specific because uh, my experience was agencies found a way to do that without notice and comment. I don't know what the guidance or whatever they, they change it, but uh, uh, so I never saw a big constraint when they wanted to adopt it. But I guess OSHA would be a particular one, right? Because they have hybrid rulemaking. But uh, okay. The, the other thing I found um, is that some some agencies will use direct final rulemaking, um, but the they just go to a final rule, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, the difficulty with that is that if you get a single adverse comment, then you have to issue an NPRM. So, the agencies are relatively really? risk averse in using direct final rulemaking because you put all the resources into publishing the direct final rule, yeah. and then one adverse comment, and you're back to the drawing board. So, unless you're fairly certain that there's going to be no controversy whatsoever, you're not. They going really to live by that rule. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that's that's well, what that's subpart D is meant exactly. to do, yeah. because it allows the agency to proceed to the you know to having the rule made effective um, after making a deter you know responding to the adverse comment and making a determination that the comment doesn't show that updating is contrary to the regulatory purpose of the of the specific regulation. But so uh, that must be that's a new the, new interpretation because I know a lot of agencies issue final rules and they get negative comments and they don't do anything after that. Well, because there's a definition, a, right? I, there's a definition. That is a new thing to me, and I've seen a lot of rules. I have not seen a case uh, when was one one person writes in on a final rule and says, "Oh, I don't like it," and the agency stops. And I ever seen that. <laughs> well, typ typically, uh, the most most agencies that use direct final rulemaking have a definition of adverse comment. So it's not, you can't just file a comment oh, okay. that just says, oh, I don't like substantive it. You have, I mean, it has to be a more okay. substantive, you know, that meets the definition of adverse comment. But yeah. if there's any genuine controversy, then you're back to the drawing board. So I, I came across a couple of agencies who said, you know, yes, we use direct final rulemaking and it works well for us, except that we don't use it as often as we might like because of the risk of an adverse See, my, comment. My only concern, I wouldn't want 
our recommendation to inhibit agencies from doing what they're doing now. So it's a very, you see, because they, they do it pretty well now. They get to a final rule, and if you complain, you, it better be something really big before they, they go out through there. They're short of people, they just blow it off. So what I'm saying is, <laughs> as, they, as they should, but what I'm saying is that in no way would this constrain what they're doing now, right? Right, and okay. that's, why, that's why we have A and B. A is designed to put the burden of identifying revisions and, um, and presenting the information of, of whether or not to update, like, to put that on the private party so that the agency isn't obligated to keep track of revisions and do the analysis themselves in all cases. And B is intended to make sure that the agency retains the ultimate decision of whether to update so that this doesn't become an obligation to update any time there's a new revision. I would like to hear from the representative from the Coast Guard, which has a significant amount of experience in this area. Um, thank you. And I actually echo your concerns that 11 maybe doesn't really get us all the way. I think for if it's the focus, and I recognize the focus is for the hybrid requirements, but for other agencies, a doesn't really get us anything because the public may already file those petitions. And if an agency is to act on that petition, they would still need to go through a full notice and comment rulemaking. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out that in D, um, the idea that we could continue directly to a final rule despite adverse comments is not typically in the spirit of what a direct final rule does. And although agencies may have some leeway in limiting what an adverse comment is, it is true that one adverse comment can make the agency have to go back and they've expended their resources on a, a direct final rule and they have to go back to an NPRM. And even the um, having to respond to uh, an adverse comment would require another rulemaking publication. So I'm not quite sure that A and D get get anything more than what's actually already happening. Um, and instead, I would like to suggest to the committee that what would happen after an interested party files this petition that includes the analysis of what has changed, that an agency could actually adopt it, adopt the recommendation as final without necessarily putting forth a notice of proposed rulemaking, but just putting a notice of availability or notice of inquiry, excuse me, notice of intent out there saying, we intend to adopt this petition. There's still a comment period, but the agency isn't bound to backtrack if they do receive an adverse comment. And that would apply to both regular, regular agencies and the hybrid required agencies. And because I feel like w in reading Recommendation 11, it doesn't really get us anywhere m further than where we already potentially are. And the idea of issuing the notice is that it's not necessarily um, notice and comment under the APA, but it's still fulfilling that same purpose. But it will give the agency's leeway to respond to a comment saying, thank you, but we do disagree without that comment actually reverting back to you know, make it make the agency backtrack if my comments were clear enough. I'll interrupt the discussion for one moment to introduce to people in the room and on the phone that we've been joined by uh, Judge Lauren Smith, one of the members of the committee. Welcome. And Thank you. Uh, hey, well, actually, you should call it the late Lauren Smith. <laughs> well, not that late. <laughs> <laughs> former illustrious chairman. Chairman of ACUS. Former chairman. Now that I've truly interrupted the flow, I wonder <laughs> if, um, if either the, the Committee on Style or um, other members of the uh, committee wish to be heard on the suggestion. Well, I would just say, Issa, we, we, we struggled with the very issue that you identified of, of how we could do something that would help uh, agencies that are not bound by anything more than 553. I mean, I think C is helpful for those agencies, but what could we do that would help agencies and still be consistent with the idea of direct final rulemaking? So I like your suggestion. I'm just I'm just working on how we would embody that in language. Would you like me to suggest some language? Sure. Um, I would keep A and B as is and start C with um, the, the agency action, which would authorize agencies to grant the petition by issuing a final rule without regard to the provisions of Chapter 5 and 6 of Title 5 USC and other hybrid rulemaking issues as necessary put in there, provided that the agency first, one, publishes a notice of petition in the Federal Register, indicates that the notice, uh, in the notice what regulations the requested update would affect and provides the public comment on the petition, and two, finds that updating regulations as requested in the petition is beneficial and consistent with the regulatory purpose. Excuse me, purpose of the relevant regulation. So I see you have this written down. So. Okay. I do. That's 
Can we incorporate that in reference? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd be happy to provide that language, but the, the intent of it is to um, the agency follow-up action and response to the petition would be a notice in the Federal Register announcing this petition and the agency's intention and taking comment on it without it actually um, being considered under the APA, the notice and comment, and all that comes with it. And it would apply to all agencies, including the hybrid rulemaking agencies. So whatever language we would need to put in there to, to make sure it's clear that it's without regard to other legal obligations. And then the second piece is that the agency has to make a full statement that they find the petition to be one that they would want to, uh, to incorporate and, or excuse me, into, uh, to uh, finalize, and that it's consistent with the regulatory purposes. In essence, in essence that that's going Coast Guard wide from the rest of the government, because you do all that right now. Um, no, actually, we are limited by the APA requirements. So we do, really? we do, do notice and comment rulemakings um, oh. for all um, substantive updates to our technical standards, and we have tried to use uh, direct final rules to try to streamline that process. But one adverse comment can disrupt that depending upon the substance. Would those be subject to judicial review? As a final agency action, because it would end in a final rule. So, would be. So I would yeah. presume that. Yeah. So when you, so I, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to remember the way you had articulated it when you said it was not subject to the APA requirements. Okay. I'm just trying to think how that affects the. Finale, but we would still get of the notice and comment. Well, there would still, it would be a notice, but we would still have to then issue the actual rule itself to make it an effective final rule. But that final rule would have been issued outside of the APA requirements. Can you read the first part of it again? Yeah, I'm going to There's a one-off copy. Um, Take them uh, Yeah, I suppose so. I have other draft language on here and some oh. other internal comments, so if you could limit it to the, to the language, that would be fine. Yeah. Um, but the first suggestion is, I mean, to whatever extent the language, you know, needs to be updated, but it would, in response to that petition that A, um, that A um, provides for, the agencies would be then going to a final rule in, in two steps. One, just a notice out to the public and a to the public the comment country. on that. And then, ultimately, the agency action would be the final rule. We, for those of you on the phone, we're going to have uh, the text copied and distributed to people in the room, and then when we have that back, I'll ask the proponent to um, uh, read that. Can I ask the question of clarification, John? It's Warren Belmar on the phone. Go ahead, Warren. Now, would this only apply, this, this suggestion, to instances where the incorporated by reference standards are being have been updated by the private party would develop the standards so as to just adopt the new standards or is it a broader application then oh yeah we're not proposing a standards application we're not proposing a general change to the notice and rule comment rulemaking process that would certainly be a, a oh, yes. <laughs> thing to suggest. This, this is this is just for this unique circumstance where all one agency is trying to do is say we're, we're keeping the regulation we're just updating the incorporated reference to be in a reference to the more current version of those materials. Okay. And it would be specifically in response to a petition received that details out what is what the changes would be. We're in a brief pause period here while waiting for the text to come back. I'm gonna do a mute. Yeah. Someone on the phone, we're hearing a, a sort of wind-like noise, so if you might be the source of that, if you could put your phone on mute, please. It's the person who's at the beach in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a litigator. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, while we're waiting, we could ask if there are any, any other changes to 611. That's it. Um, Jonathan has made the good point while we're waiting. Does any member of the committee wish to propose further changes to the text of Recommendation 6 through 11? Uh, say, John, this is Bill. I wonder, you know, with regard to 6, the reference to access information, I wonder if, you, if, if, if we could clarify that. I mean, it, it just, uh, for someone coming across this for the first time, access to what? Um, and maybe I'm the only one that's somewhat confused by that, that reference. 
Secondly, with, with regard to eight, uh, the reference to regulation, the last word, I think you mean legislative regulation. I think just using regulation, it could include a non-legislative rule, but I think in context, uh, you mean uh, a legislative rule. And then finally, uh, with regard to nine, um, if we have an agency that is incorporated by reference, uh, various things that are changing dynamically, and then is placed in the situation where it has to exercise enforcement discretion frequently or issue a lot of equivalency determinations, doesn't that suggest that that agency from the get-go should ask whether it should incorporate by reference? Because it does seem to me that, um, that having a situation where uh, a lot of the, quote, law is really not on the books but in, is involved with agency discretion, we have some serious public access problems. So I'm wondering if there's a way to work into this some suggestion that if, in fact, uh, there is this problem of keeping it up to date that the agency should, from the get-go, ask itself whether incorporation by reference is appropriate in light of the need to make sure that the law is clear uh, uh, from the point of view of the regulated entities. It's a little separate from the update. If I could just respond on, on Bill's question with regard to number six, the access information that is mentioned in uh, number six, and, and Bill, perhaps you're right that we should uh, make this a little clearer for people who don't know what that is. Uh, that is required to be published in the CFR, I believe. And it, it's just a statement of where the public can get a copy of the incorporated materials, perhaps having to pay for it, but just where they can get it. And okay. uh, I believe uh, Emily's research suggests that if that were the only change, if, if the only change is, you know, this was previously available from ASTM, but now somebody else publishes it, and, and it's just a question of telling the public where you can get it, that change would be considered a technical change that could be made without going through the notice and comment process. Okay. Um, is it a term of art? Is that what we're? Is that what you're saying, John? That uh, I uh, don't know, Emily. Can you comment on that? It's a shorthand I've used. I don't <laughs> think I would go so far as to call it a term of art, though. Um, I mean, we could certainly clarify it either there or in the preamble. Or you could drop, could you drop a footnote mm -hmm. and just... We could. Uh, to avoid the uh, disruption and flow or something like that. Sure. Looks like the CFR. I think that, that that makes good sense, and I think that's one of those technical comments that traditionally um, this committee has left to the discretion of the chairman of the committee in consultation with ACA staff um, to be cleaned up um, before the final version is uh, submitted to the, uh, the, 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 um, the presidential appointees of ACAS for con consideration, which will be in the early part of November. Um, if I hear no objection from other members of the committee, I'd propose that we handle this issue in that fashion. And no, hearing no objections, then we'll take this offline and, um, um, and resolve it before the, uh, the version goes forward to the full conference. Uh, while we have, a, uh, have not yet resumed the discussion of um, 11, I would ask if anybody has any further suggestions to make to changes that we should consider besides the three that Bill just suggested. Uh, hearing none, then I, I propose that we uh, complete the discussion of 11 and then we come back and address 8 and 9. Now, the, where we were is, are the copies back yet, Scott? Uh, the copies are not back. I, I stand corrected. We'll now move to uh, number 8. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, here one in one door, out the other. Okay. Sorry to play ping pong with those of you on the phone. We're about to go back to uh, number eleven, and um, and I'll ask um, that, that you uh, read your proposal for people on the phone. Um, <laughs> the 
proposal trying to get at this idea of the agency follow-up action would be a notice and then the final rule would be that um, agencies that the rec recommendation we're making to Congress is that um, the Congress would authorize agencies to grant the petition reference to A by issuing a final rule without regard to the provisions of Chapter 5 and 6 of Title 5 USC provided that the agency first publishes a notice of the petition in the Federal Register indicates in the notice what regulations the requested update would affect and provides for public comment on the petition and two finds that updating regulations as requested in the petition is beneficial and consistent with the regulatory purpose of the relevant regulation and then we would delete the current subpart d exactly and c as well it, it, yeah this would replace this would replace, would replace, oh, this would replace. Okay. i for one would just like to thank you because Recommendation 11 has been uh, one of the more challenging aspects outside of the context of the access issues, and I think this is a, a very productive and useful suggestion. Thank you so much. David Frederick. I just still have a question about what we are saying without regard to the provisions of Chapters 5 and 6 of Title 5. That is very broad and sweeping language, and sitting here today, I can't vote to know what we're exempting with that broad language unless we restrict it in some fashion to those provisions that pertain to the actual issuance or the promulgation of the rules because there's a lot in those chapters, I believe. Could we say without regard to otherwise applicable rulemaking requirements? Which would also that encompass. It. Yeah, that narrows it, surely. Right. And, and that would also have hybrid. the advantage of encompassing mm -hmm. what might be in an agency's organic statute, mm -hmm. such as OSHA. Yeah. I would hate for us to make a mistake on incorporations by Good. reference yeah. in the incorporations <laughs> by reference um, recommendation. <laughs> so, issuing a final rule without regard to otherwise applicable rulemaking requirements. I mean, very friendly, friendly, of course. Amendment. Absolutely right. friendly amendment and, and fully achieves the purpose right. of trying to still provide some public comment opportunity but without yeah. requiring agencies to go through all the hoops for for other types of rulemaking when they're just updating the corporation by reference in response to a petition. Does anybody else wish to be heard on the proposed modification? You know, it, it seems that there is a consensus that we should um, incorporate this change into the recommendations as we will vote on them. Um, is that process acceptable to everyone, all members of the committee? I'm seeing nods and hearing no objection, so we'll deem that to be the text in which we'll vote. Um, then uh, the next order of business is to revert back to the um, Bill's comment on uh, recommendation eight. That the material by reference in a basically to change the last word regulation to have the sense of legislative rule right that, that appears um, to be a good correction to me um, does anyone wish to comment or raise an objection or a further thought on um, point eight then uh, then hearing no objection now we will deem um, bill's uh, proposed change to be adopted in the text if we will vote on it um, which brings us now to number nine, where I think there, this probably will need um, substantive discussion. And Bill, given the time that's passed, could I ask you to restate your point here? Uh, yeah. He, when, when I, it seems to me that an agency, if it does, if it is confronting a situation where there may be significant changes over time, and it may have to deal with this through enforcement, discretion, or standards, that the fact that that way of dealing with the regulation muddies what the law is, um, that, that that's a factor the agency should consider in not adopting by reference. Uh, I don't think we want, it does seem to me that we, we can't be indifferent to the problems from the regulated point of, uh, regulated entities point of view that are created by a situation where they really have to rely on enforcement to discretion or non or uh, non-legislative rules to find out what their legal obligations are so uh, there's got to be a cautionary note that we should send to agencies that you really should think about this problem before you jump into incorporating by reference 
Does anyone on the committee wish to be heard on the issue? Um, does um, um, perhaps the people who first drafted the um, the recommendation would like to comment then? I mean, I guess a way to implement that that there seems to me two slightly different themes in, in that comment, but but one way to implement it would be uh, add at the end of what is now nine uh, agencies should consider the cost of updating standard of, of updating when de deciding whether to use incorporation by reference. That would work if you it would if, if we kind of elaborate cost cost to regulated entities and and to the agency itself something like that. Would that Well maybe it's fairness not cost. Or well, fairness is also, yeah. I mean, doesn't fairness in, in, include that? If you impose unreasonable costs, it's unfair to a regulated entity. On the other hand, the agency then has the discretion to consider how much is needed to be fair. I mean, if, if it's available somewhere easily, then it's fair if you incorporate it by reference. If it isn't, then that may be a reason. Well, but this is this is in the updating section. I mean, the right. yeah. I mean, this is the, the problem is that yes, Paul, uh, just to respond. Uh, yeah. Also, you know, uh, this is only an updating. We've already made the choice to incorporate by reference. Right. So that it's the question of how do we get out of this pickle where things change and the agency has to catch up. We're not recommending that they do these things, but what we're recommending is letting people know if that's how they're going to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they've already made the choice. In other words, uh, no, I understand that, Paul, and I uh, and I, and I understand that this is kind of coming in the back door. Yeah. But and and maybe there is no good uh, place to put this in the recommendation language. I mean, one other option would be to put it maybe in the preamble as a cautionary note. That strikes me as a reasonable solution because the problem we're wrestling here is that you, if the agency determines to go down this track, that it should provide public notice um, of uh, what the equivalent determinations or use of discretion will be. And that is a common practice in government for those um, uh, enforcement um, dis discretion to have been exercised, but the public often is not aware of it or the people who are aware of it are only those who work the agency day in, day out. So I'm comfortable with the general technique that's being recommended here, and I'm enthusiastic about the proposal that the agency would have to find a way to notify the public. And if we could build the, the, the concerns for fairness and other considerations into the, um, uh, the text as it's going to be submitted to um, the conference for um, adoption and as, um, to be available to the agencies as they consider it, I think that might be a useful addition. Yeah, it seems to me we could change the order of the part of the sentences because it starts out you know we're trying to correct something maybe it's we ought to get any interest of fairness and transparency it, uh, i think we could fix the paragraph to make it clear that we're trying to improve a situation that already exists but limit it to the updating area where we're not we're not changing the rules of the game because the agency's already made a decision to use incorporation by reference which it's required or encouraged to do under the technology transfer act and under all other you know i mean that would be mm -hmm. un we don't want to unpack all of that and say let's go back and challenge the initial okay. decision to use a standard might I suggest that maybe some of the concern is with the phrase prohibitively burdensome to keep up with revisions, making it seem as if agencies incorporate by reference one and then say, oh, we're never going to do it again because it's, it's too hard to update the standards. And instead, it's more that other agency priorities take up rulemaking resources and eventually standards become outdated, whether it was a, a conscious choice on the agency or not. Um, and that that's the issue trying to be uh, resolved rather than the fact that agencies are just saying, I give up, it's too costly. Perhaps, you know, there's something in that language that is um, providing some of the concern. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think. And uh, <clears throat> can we do it? Maybe. I mean, maybe we could change it to something like you know, when agencies find that they can't update their regulations that incorporate by reference. I mean, I, I don't know what the language would be, but something. Yes, maybe something when agencies find that their incorporated by reference standards are are outdated, often out, coming outdated, they should use equivalency determinations or something that maybe makes it a little <coughs> bit less of one specific issue that agencies are choosing not to do the updates. We've gone around the table to some degree here, and I'm not certain how we would articulate what is actually on the table right at this moment. <laughs> but it strikes me that this is one of those issues that should be com committed to the Committee on Style because it seems that we have general consensus about driving in this direction. Um, and I, I might ask Jonathan if you'd like to undertake the heroic effort of trying to capsulize where you think we are and, and what might be proposed for reference to the Committee on Style. Well, I, I, I think there's two things. First, there's Issa's last comment that the first phrase in 9 might be changed to something more like, you know, if an agency is up, unable to update its uh, regulations to keep up with a revision of a standard incorporated by reference, okay, something like that. And then uh, it's not quite clear to me whether the consensus includes adding a sentence to the preamble that would say agencies should consider the cost of updating when deciding to use IBR in the first place. People want that? Yeah. Uh, the chairman. No, no, I, I don't want to speak to uh, the committee, but I think I can fix this. If we drop the first sentence and start with the second sentence, and at the end of the second sentence, simply say, so it reads, in the interest of fairness and transparency, agencies should publish regulations or guidance establishing policies and principles governing equivalency determinations or guiding their use of enforcement discretion, comma, in situations where they've been able to update their, you know, up, in situations where they've been able to update uh, their regulations. That would work for me. Oh, okay, great. Great. regulations which incorporate by reference. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But then, it, then it puts the primary yeah. point, which is fairness, which is... Yeah, I like that. Chairman Smith's point. The committee has benefited from the advice of a man who has survived hundreds of faculty meetings in law school. Funny as scar. Excuse me, uh, May I comment, John? Well, please. Hi, this is Bruce Mahone with SAE. Um, I just wanted to point out that, in, as is patently obvious, uh, standards are generally only changed when there is a significant reason to. To use the example of the hard hats that was brought up earlier, a standard for a hard hat wouldn't change just because. There would have to be a change in the technology or a change in some safety statistics or something so that if an agency is having a hard time keeping up with the changes in the standards, it's really keeping up with the changes of the technology or some safety rules. So switching to where an agency's rules would not reference standards doesn't speed anything up. Because I heard an implication a few minutes ago from some of the comments that if you can't keep up with the standard revisions, you should consider not incorporating by reference. But I don't think that solves the problem. Right. That just okay. moves the burden from the agency from keeping up with the standards to still keeping up with changes in technology some other way. Yeah. Just a comment. You no, no, I, I, well, well, Good. Taken. well, well delivered. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> See, I caution the, the, the people on the phone that there's some domestic discussions <laughs> leaking through. <laughs> there are mute buttons. <laughs> That's theirs, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my proposal remains on the table that w with this set of instructions uh, that we uh, uh, delegate this function to a, a committee on style. Um, it, are there any objections to that approach? Hearing none, then I think that we're ready to put the uh, a general uh, motion to uh, uh, adopt 6 through 11 as uh, um, 
amended as discussed over the last half an hour to a vote. Um, would someone so move? And so moved. Second? Second. We have a second. So um, the proposal is to um, um, adopt recommendations 6 through 11 as amended and engrossed. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Yes. Opposed, nay. Uh, the vote is unanimous. The recommendations are adopted. Now we'll move to the, uh, the next recommendations 12 through 18, um, which deal with procedural requirements and improved drafting techniques. I propose that we consider these recommendations on block and, and ask if uh, anyone wishes to be heard on this issue. We are the, and I think we'll begin with this one with um, the, the voice of the Federal Register. Amy, would you proceed? Thank you. Uh, I just have a, I have one general comment on 14 and then um, some concerns about 12 and 13. Uh, when it's talking about the last sentence of 12 where it says such agencies should take advantage of OFR's training opportunities and its document drafting handbook. I'd like to say this about the document drafting handbook and I think as I said at the last meeting I have a staff of two people so there's three of us at the office of the Federal Register who review all uh, requests for incorporation by reference across the federal government so when it says take advantage uh, I think it sort of <laughs> puts uh, the Federal Register staff at a disadvantage because the document drafting handbook is really the way that the agency should submit the requests for incorporation by reference because when they don't it really slows down the approval review so I'd like to add there uh, after the word and follow the procedures of the document drafting handbook give everybody a minute <laughs> All right, fine. Why don't we proceed um, with your suggestions the way we did with bills? Why don't we yeah. state them all, and then we'll um, have a general discussion of all comments. Yep. Uh, in 13, at the sort of the middle of that first sentence, it talks about OFR policy. And um, what's unfortunate is that a lot of agencies don't realize that the OFR has regulations. So it's more than just policy. We have a set of regulations for, incorpor for incorporation by reference approval. And I, using the word policy allows people to forget that there are regulations that they need to comply with in this regard. And regulations at the top. Or even, uh, yeah, or. Substitute. Substitute, but I think regulations and policy, and that'll bring in the, the document drafting handbook. Thank you. All right. So the proposal is to word, add the words regulations and between OFR and policy. So that's 13. Uh, yep. 14? Uh, this is my comment on 14. Uh, uh, as I mentioned at the last meeting, we have started a pilot program so that agencies, uh, including the Coast Guard, can FTP their um, IBR requests. So that would be the standards, the um, draft final rule, and the request letter. Uh, what happened? late last week was that we had a, one of the agencies that we were in a pilot with. Unfortunately, the person who was tasked to deliver the material with us uh, was not computer savvy, and it sucked up a lot of our time. So um, we're going to continue to allow agencies that maybe don't have personnel who are completely computer savvy to follow the old procedure, which is to deliver all the material to us at our office in a paper format. Um, so while it is very expeditious and uh, cost effective and it, to use an electronic submission means it's not always the best. So do you have a... I don't have any changes. I just thought I'd, I'd just like to put that on the table. So. I doubt we'll could ever we, go completely electric. Could we change transitioning to to you know expand upon its electronic submission so that it's we're, we're requesting an expansion rather than a complete transition? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. No one in their office can send it electronically in a whole agency. <laughs> that seems like a. I I, I don't that know. That seems like an outlier to me. Um, it's a rather large agency. Anyway. 
Okay. It was not the Coast Guard. <laughs> no, <laughs> and we know how to use it. We love it. All right, Judge Smith. I just had a little little question. Should you add a little thing? The DDD, uh, DD, uh, H after you, we made that change from policy to regulations. I don't think in the first paragraph we mentioned that the document drafting handbook we talk of it in terms of a training manual. I think it should might be useful to mention that it, that's the that's what the rules are. And that's a rule book. My, well, most people might probably know. Policy. Yeah. But yeah, most people know. But I think it doesn't hurt to put DDH after regulations found in found in the DDH uh, on, on number thirteen. It, the, the DDH right is policy. DDH. No, no, no. The the DDH is the policy that explains to agencies the regulations. Well, that's what that's where the regulations are located. Does I understand it, or is that you get copies of the regulations in the DDH? Well, we explain the regulations in the DDH. Okay. <laughs> so it would be regulations and policies found in the DDH, well, or I think regulations, DDH, and policy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I don't think the regulations are literally in the DDH. No, no, They're in the no, 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 no. They're in the annotation of it. Okay. Could I, could I get the amendment on 14 read back? It sounded wordy and funky to me, um, if I've got it down. I understood it as being replacing transitioning to an with expanding its. Why couldn't we just substitute including by transitioning to with the word through. Or tell them to take a, uh, a lesson in computers. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that. That's not in our Sorry. regs. <laughs> I think David's suggestion works. I think as long as the option is to either submit it electronically or to submit it in hard copy, as long as those two options are still open to agencies, I'm fine all, with whatever all, all, all my suggestion does is to say OFR should continue and expand upon its efforts to make the process easier through an electronic submission and review process for incorporation. It doesn't foreclose existing paper. It just says okay. if you, you, know, you should expand and do this through electronics if you can. Right, it rules nothing out, but emphasizes electronic submission. Right. That seems yeah. fine to me. Yeah, that's fine. Are there any other comments before we move to uh, adoption of these recommendations on block? Well, hearing no comments, I'd entertain a motion to um, uh, adopt recommendations 12 through 18 have as... Um, have the amendments that were discussed been adopted? Are we going on 15 and 18 as well? Yes, if, if, if I thought we would have those all on a block. So if you have comments on 15 and 18, why don't we hear those now? Um, I have two comments, one on 16 and one on 17. Um, the one on 16, it seems to imply in that last sentence that agencies promulgating mandatory regulations should only incorporate by reference materials that are used that use appropriate mandatory language. Um, from an agency perspective, I think that's a bit too li limiting. I think there are sometimes some non-mandatory language out there that we would want to incorporate by reference because it's used appropriately perhaps in an international standard where it's not actually a mandatory <coughs> language but more guidance to participating states. Um, and so instead, I would just um, replace the last of that sentence to make sure that agencies take care to make that man that language mandatory when they're incorporating by reference by by replacing the last sentence with agencies promulgating mandatory regulations should the change take care to specify in regulation which portions of the incorporated standard are considered mandatory after incorporation into the regulations what this change is trying to suggest is that if you're incorporating a standard that uses the words should or may that in regulation you could say we're incorporating by reference yada 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 um, except that the words may or should shall be read as shall and what that that does is right. it makes by regulation that incorporate incorporation by reference mandatory for the agency's purposes but still allows us to use a non-mandatory standard would you read that one more time sure <laughs> um, the last sentence um, agencies promulgating mandatory regulation should 
take care to specify in regulation which portions of the incorporated standard are considered, considered mandatory after incorporation into the regulations. And the language is not, you know, the right. committee may, may change the language if they so choose to adopt this recommendation, but um, the intent is to not limit agencies to using only mandatory standards but to make it clear in the regulation that they would be mandatory to adopt. And, and reading between the lines, what I hear you saying is that that change would allow you to um, incorporate the, the results of an international negotiation where some substantive problems were solved by Warren the Warren Bell. Yes, that would be one example where there the might conference. be um, non-mandatory language, but that an agency might you know, want to include it. As this is actually a really key point for the Coast Guard because so many of the international rules are done by standards as well as by um, actual rules. And so, as I recall the Coast Guard's international national regulatory scheme, it does incorporate a lot by reference through uh, international standard setting bodies and treaties that call for certain performance on vessels and uh, crewing, staffing, and a watch requirements and things like that for cruise ships and oil tankers and all sorts of stuff. But the recommendation is not limited to Coast Guard. It, it applies to right. all other right. agencies that would have other uses for non-mandatory standards. And increasingly over time, as more of these um, issues are resolved internationally, it will be a growing problem, and you're just an early adopter. That, that's, yeah. that, that sounds good. That's um, a change on 16. Uh, you have one more? I do. Um, and the um, other one is for 17. And the recommendation would be just to delete that last sentence that says, if an agency wants to make a second tier docu ma document mandatory, it should incorporate it by reference. Um, the concern here is that we would then have an incorporated by reference into a rule that then has no actual uh, additional reference to that standard since it's contained solely in the original incorporated standard. Um, and it could cause confusion in requiring that it actually be incorporated by reference. And that would be a change from current um, current policy on secondary. And perhaps the issue we were trying to address with that third sentence is already addressed by the first sentence. I also, because I really didn't follow that statement you made, but sure. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the purpose of, of the, the modification would not be to change that agency should absolutely be clear on what they're going to be requiring or considering about the second tier documents, but the recommendation is to actually eliminate that last sentence that would require an agency to actually go through the process of incorporating those second tier standards. And the concern is you would then have a rule that has specific language that says this standard is incorporated by reference, but it's never actually included in the text of the rule, the same way that the original incorporated by reference standard is. Amy? Uh, I would like to follow up by talking about the, the, no, the new last sentence of 17, talking about how the OFR should explain and highlight its policy on secondary references. I, the document drafting handbook is a guidance document on how agencies should submit IBR approval requests. We don't issue any type of legal guidance in that document. And I would advise the director probably not to take a stand on that issue. Leave it in there. <laughs> but I'm not sure the LOFR was. <laughs> so is, is the proposal basically that, that we delete the specific reference to OFR, and if ACUS wants to make that recommendation, ACUS should make it itself, that the agency should um, um, pay careful attention to the issue of secondary references, something like that? Yeah, or just, yeah, to, or, or to just delete, delete that sentence, sentence entirely. But, can I just ask Amy a question? If, if we follow ESA's suggestion of deleting the last sentence of 17, what happens to secondary references? If, if an agency incorporates a document which itself incorporates another document, is that secondarily referenced document available at OFR? Is it, is it, does the agency have to deposit it with OFR? No. 
The only document that has been incorporated by reference is the original document. Mm -hmm. That's the only one that's been approved, and that's the only one that's referenced in the CFR. All right. So that, so so there, that might be some purpose to be served by the original last sentence to uh, help the public by ensuring that they can at least go to FR and get all the documents. Well, then I would recommend that instead of requiring an agency go through the process of incorporating that by reference, that they make it available or that they that they explain how those other documents can be available if they are making the secondary references mandatory. There is a process of incorporating the document by reference that has some legal effect to it that an agency should be able to decide what legal effect they want those second-tier documents to have. But I think if the, issue, if the concern is making sure that they're available to the public, that there's another recommendation we can make besides requiring agencies go through the process of incorporating it by reference. And, and that, that's what deleting the sentence would, would get at. So if there's right. a, just modifying that sentence to get at the same thing, that would be consistent with my recommendation. So if we replaced at the end, it should incorporate it by reference how about it should deposit those documents with OFR? No, you don't want them. <laughs> <laughs> or, or be available to the public or something. Yeah, that's yeah. better. Yeah, the only documents. He doesn't want all that mail over. They only, they only have three people in a little cubby hole. But if you put in, <laughs> if, if you put in uh, it should be available to the public, which is true because those secondary sources sometimes are very hard to get. I mean, they're, that may be a subject of another committee meeting okay. if you try to try. I, I, I'm a little rough to say they, they should just make them available well, because what if they're copyrighted, right? I mean, that, that gets us back to the whole oh, person. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. But, right, right. but or, well, reasonably inform available. the public where the documents can be accessed. Yes, yeah. how about that? Right. Can I just register a little bit of discomfort here? If the purpose of this is to say secondary references can become mandatory, why is it that we're not asking agencies to go through whatever process of incorporation for the secondary references. These are rules that we're saying are okay to be mandatory on private parties and regulated entities. Why is it that the agency gets to have a set of shadow rules that apply to private actors simply through secondary references? I'm, am I missing something? I'm a little confused by this. I don't know if someone in the standard setting community would like to speak to that. Do you is it a practice that you incorporate secondary materials in your standards? I, I would leave it to the standards developers themselves. Um, it's an interesting issue, um, and one that I have not thought of until this discussion started. To tell you the truth. Yeah, the general rule of thumb. Uh, this is Bruce Mom with SAE. The general rule of thumb is that any uh, standard required in the body of a standard usually is a requirement because quite often these references involve definitions, test methods, uh, quality systems, so they often are requirements. Sometimes uh, it's pretty common that the appendices or annexes to a standard will be guidance material and not mandatory, but it's quite common in a standard that there are reference documents that are requirements in the standard. Growing up with the National Fire Protection Association, um, NFPA standards widely reference uh, secondary standards, and I would venture, if you looked at the secondary standards, they reference tertiary standards. My 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 question is, since those standards, as part of the, the integrated whole, require that things be done in accordance with secondary standards, if you were to have a procedure that was too onerous on the adopting agencies in terms of analyzing and having copies of all secondary and tertiary standards for them to be mandatory, you might end up with a situation where you have regulatory rules in the form of the primary standards that are incomplete and, and don't give a full recipe for what the prescribed rules that you're supposed to be following if I'm making this clear. I don't think that's an easy question to answer, but something more general about secondary standards having some notices to their availability or something, rather than requiring that each one be identified and, and uh, have a separate rulemaking might be a better way to go, because it's a, it, it is a little bit of a can of worms if you're going to be trying to pick and choose. Is there some way to focus on the general problem because I think David is, is right if you're going to be governed by standards which you don't have either in the incorporation or in the rule there should be at least some thought by the agency of making these available in some way 
and maybe that's the way to go, since these are a lot of individualized cases, uh, presumably a lot of the regulated community have the standard books and have the materials, uh, that the agency should at least consider the availability as an important issue. Well, does the, does the agency currently, Lisa, for example, does, does your agency, how do you make available, do you have them in your reading room, in, uh, it immediately incorporated standards? Uh, yeah, we, we um, provide two options. One is to come visit the Coast Guard, um, and we have them available upon request. You can't make a copy of anything, but you can right. sit and look at them all day, um, or to visit the Federal Register. We also okay. provide how to contact them, the standards organization so directly. Could you do the same thing for secondarily incorporated materials? We could, um, and I, I suppose, you know, to further explain some of the suggestion is, in, a, in rulemaking text, when you're incorporating by reference, it's a very specific and exact procedure that you're following. And usually the incorporation by reference is approved by the Federal Register for use in the regulatory text. N very rarely do the regulatory text actually reference directly in that regulatory text the secondary standard. So to, to go through the process of getting incorporated, there'd be nowhere to have it approved to. We'd have to add in mm -hmm. extra text, which could be confusing to um, readers that there's three standards but incorporated, but only one of them is actually referenced in the text. So I don't think it's, um, there is definitely not an objection to making anything that we're wanting to make mandatory available. I think it's using the IBR process mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to fully contemplate how to capture those standards. It's definitely not trying to make standards that we're trying to make, secondary standards that we're wanting to make mandatory unavailable. It's just right. what process we're to be using of them. But I do think it's, you know, we. I agree with the general recommendation of an agency should be aware of what secondary standards are in an original document and should be clear about what they're doing with them. So how about if an agency wants to make a second tier document mandatory, it should ensure that that document is as available to the public as a directly incorporated mm -hmm. standard. Yeah. 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 That's fine. So John Hill, would that be a case by case basis then? In other words, the, the you look at each each in each situation how that the, the the original standard was being incorporated, and then you, or or being 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 avail made available. I'm um, getting back right. to the whole idea of sort of the, the reasonably available language we've used in the past. That sort of again this hopefully this dynamic, whether that's a, a term of art or not, I, I don't know. Well, as available as a directly incorporated standard, you know, doesn't as as. No, from the first part of the recommendation does not mean posted on the agency's website where everyone can read it for free. I mean, sometimes that would be true, but not in general. So just as available as the directly incorporated standard would be, however, we've solved that problem. Yes, ma'am. I, I can tell from experience that NIPA standards may be more available than the secondary standards we reference. We make all our standards available read only on the web, but ASTM or other students that we make mandatory within our documents might not be available. If I can be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As if it were directly incorporated? Maybe. That's, no, that's just the same thing. If I can be excused in advance for mixing metaphors, we seem to have a sort of Russian dolls here that they're going to be um, standard yeah, nestled within right. standards. Yeah. And I think the only solution to that is to come back around and repeat the original iteration, which is the um, the agency should work with the, uh, the standard setting organization on this issue. Um, it's going to be the standard setting organization that knows best what's incorporated secondarily and what the best way to provide public access to that is, or it could be made part of your licensing discussions. Could we say ensure that such material is reasonably available? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. It's back to one. Now. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And it, it's not exactly circular, but it retraces a, a path <laughs> at, the, at the next level down. Sort of a left. There we go. <laughs> Okay, well that solves the last sentence of seven. What happened to the next to last sentence? I thought it was deleted. <laughs> Amy's proposing deleting the next to last sentence. Would it would deleting the and explain its position be sufficient? Because the biggest problem I found is that a lot of agencies aren't really aware of this issue until it until it comes back to bite them. Um, and so the the main point 
for me really was to make agencies aware of this potential issue and get them to address it. So just highlighting it might be helpful. So that we're not necessarily asking OFR to take a position on it, but right. maybe just yeah. highlight the potential issue. And if we're going to handle it that way, should the, the OFR sentence become the third sentence? That sort of becomes the action item. We establish the criteria the agency should follow. That is, they should make the information reasonably available. And we make OFR um, an, an, an entity that simply reminds them of that fact. Not I, I'm OK with that. You're, yeah. you're not an enforcement agency, but it would just be a way that you could further underline that point. They're an enforcement agency. <laughs> People listen to the register. May I offer a friendly amendment? Because the word highlight seems to give, I don't know, more umph and juice than <laughs> I think we're talking about here. And it would seem appropriate just to say, consider amending the DDH to um, increase awareness of agencies to the potential issues. We just or change it to, like instead of instead highlight, of maybe mention? Mention? Call to the attention. Call you don't need anything. Any, you don't need any word there. You say, oh, I should consider amending the DHH. You don't see why you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Working true, true won't be way silent. <laughs> I'm a change highlight to call attention to. Sure. So I think that would conclude the discussion on 17. Um, I think we should go back around the committee one more time to see if anybody else um, has a proposal to make to modify the text to propose recommendations uh, 12 to 18. Um, hearing no comments, I think now we're ready for a, um, a motion that we um, deem the amendments to 11 to 18 that we've discussed to be um, uh, incorporated in the recommendations as they'll be proposed for a vote to recommend to the full committee. I'll move. Second? Second. Um, are there any objections to the proposal to consider the amended text we've been working on? Hearing none, then I'll move to the final step, which is to um, entertain a motion to adopt um, recommendations 12 through 18 as amended. <coughs> so moved by uh, Judge Smith. Uh, seconds? Mr. Mr. Frederick? Um, well, all who favor the um, adoptions of 12 through 18 as amended, please so signify by stating aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Uh, the vote is unanimous. The recommendations are adopted. Thank you very much. I think that concludes the uh, the work of the committee today. Well, Unless the, the uh, Jonathan, you have other comments you wish to make? Uh, the only other thing is, I mean, I, I presume the committee has now adopted recommendations. Um, the only other thing is that, uh, as we have discovered uh, in committees, including this one in the past, it, it frequently happens that there are some small changes. We discover little grammatical things or whatnot, sometimes in response to council suggestions. So committees have authorized their chair to adopt such changes on behalf of the committee uh, if, in the chair's judgment, uh, it does not require further committee consideration. So uh, I would ask that the committee adopt that same procedure. I'll, I'll, set, I'll move that. I'll second it. Are there any objections to the motion? Hearing none, then it will be deemed adopted. And at this point, I think if there's no further business, I, if the chairman wishes to be heard before we conclude. No, I just want to make an observation uh, about this session, which is that I am the, as you know, the 101st member of the administrative conference. and. So I, I kind of, these were all like my children, all these little <laughs> recommendations, as, as, uh, as Lauren will recall, they were in his time. But this one is one of my favorite kids. Uh, and, and I can't tell you how important I think this session has been and what great work, especially the people who have come in from, who aren't on the committee and, and have pitched in as well as the committee. Um, I think this is an enormous project of great importance, and I think we've moved things significantly. First of all, 
it's got to be the case that there's a lot more incorporation. We think we don't even think about it. There are probably more pages of standards that aren't legislation than are legislation by far. Maybe I don't know what the multiple might be. It'd be interesting to know that. So incorporation by reference is an enormous undertaking of government, and we've helped make this better. We pushed on the uh, openness side. We we negotiated, I think, well with the copyright issue. Uh, and, and, and as Scott has said, uh, you know, this is an evolving world. We're concerned about due process and openness in the, in the creation of private standards. That isn't really the focus of this issue. Uh, but that's something always on our mind. And we're ourselves a public-private partnership, like many of the S SOs are. Uh, and so I think this is really great stuff. Thank you. Here, here. Right here. <laughs> and, and that is the last word. The uh, committee meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you sir.